We are here today having conversations with engineering management at a company that believes culture and diversity are as important as engineering acumen. We're here talking with New Relic. We're a software analytics company. Um, we definitely made our mark um, starting in application performance management. So APM, um, APM exactly, um, helping people figure out you know what's going on with their web apps, why are they slow, right? Those kinds of things. Uh, but since then, we've really expanded into a much broader analytics space. So we're able to solve not just application problems, but business problems. Our job is to, to create the magic that our customers trust. And, and so that's my sort of mantra for the agents. If it's not exciting to the customers, if somebody's not really excited about what we're going to ship, it's not the right thing yet. We haven't got it right yet. So that, that to me is like the ultimate measure. How do you define your best practices? How do you guys t collectively, because I'm sure you're a diverse group of people, mm -hmm. How do you collectively define what the best practices are? Yeah, that's a great question. We have a lot of best practices, I think, that are, are very much adopted from you know what you see in Agile and Lean. So um, you know we're we're extremely committed to say demos. Uh, we're very ex committed to uh, iterative, right? So we're we're constantly looking at you know how do we drive you know value first, right? So anything from how we prioritize to how we change the you know make decisions to how we you know decide how to change a feature, even to decide what we don't ship because we don't think it's quite ready yet. You know, comes down to are we producing the best value for our customers? Are we producing you know resilient software? Are we producing that magic that our customers will trust? Because if the magic's not there, we're not going to ship it. We have a lot of ways of communicating throughout New Relic. There are um, you know we call them mini M groups uh, where, where managers meet and share information with each other. Uh, there's just the lunch mini room. M. Mini M, yeah, mini mini management groups, mm, okay. um, and 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 then there are uh, you know just our lunch conversations where people are sitting with anybody who happens to be at the table and, and discussing there. We also have a more formal architecture group with you know, anchor leads on each team that, that you know, they get together and kind of discuss the work they're doing. Uh, and then we have, of course, a ton of communication going out you know, all the time about somebody did this really cool thing. Uh, and, it and it worked. And it worked. And these are the results. And here's what you might think about if you want to do something similar. Have small teams that can work independently. Um, and do we take these various practices that we know work well, and then we spend effort, and particularly on, uh, on the management team, with making those practices really work well for New Relic. Um, we don't really take anything off the shelf and say, well, this is going to work, bam, let's just do this thing. Um, we really want to make sure that you know, we're doing things very deliberately. I think you know best practices are a thing that that come up through people's experience, right? And experience in a particular business context, and then you know people generalize that and they want to apply it to different different places. I want to apply one of those practices to New Relic, but if the only thing you ever use are best practices, you'll never come up with anything new. Uh, that's something that that Ward Cunningham likes to say. He works in New Relic. Um, and I think it's, a, it's kind of a, a wise observation, and it's one that we, we really try to apply every day. So do you see diversity, though, the, the, the breadth of different opinions, different ways people work, different ways to approach a problem? Is that a better way to go? I, I believe so. You know, I think there's a lot of talk in tech right now about diversity, uh, as, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, think, I think the reason from actually one of the most compelling things I read about it is that um, Groups that are very homogenous can can get to that you know group mind think uh, you know they, they'll agree with each other they won't challenge each other's assumptions as much which means they can move very fast in a direction you know a particular direction together um, and that can be great in some cases but with more diverse groups they found that they were more likely to challenge each other's assumptions or or come from different perspectives and so the decisions those groups made tended to be stronger so that when they did all run in the same direction they were more sure it was the right direction to go. While it's important for us to have diverse teams, and you know there are studies that show that you know diverse teams produce better results, diverse boards and diverse management teams produce better financial results. Right? We have all this data about you know, why it's the right thing to do. Um, in my mind, that's not the reason. The, the reason that we should have diverse teams is because that's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do is to create a workplace where anyone can work, where anybody can do their best work, and they can be themselves. Um, and so for me, that's why diversity is important. What does that person do to stand out, to get to you, to say, I want to hire that person? So I think that first and foremost, it's enthusiasm and curiosity. 
I mean, technical skills are important, but somebody who is intelligent, who can do, who's a great critical thinker, they can pick up technical skills. The things you can't teach are somebody who's really enthusiastic about solving problems for customers, delving into the sorts of challenges we're up against, and who really wants to just expand their horizons and explore new things, and is willing to take the step of saying, yes, I'm going to put myself out there, and I'm going to be the person to make that happen. So if someone can demonstrate that in their cover letter, um, that actually makes a world of difference. Curiosity. Um, I, I think, I think the, the most successful engineers I've seen have just been relentlessly curious about what they're working on, um, and, they're, and they're interested in what they're doing. So, um, and in fact, I've given this advice to college students before. If you, if you find that you're going down a particular path and it doesn't interest you, you're probably not going to be ultimately very happy or successful, or, or not as happy and successful as you could be. Um, and, and, and I think that's really important to just you know, find, find the, the next thing that really interests you. So rather than thinking about a 15-year career path and you know, where you want to be in 15 years, think about what you want to do right now and, and then see if that can lead to something interesting. What would be bad for your career is to always do the same thing, to follow the same process, to use the same tools, to prolong the experience of sameness because what that doesn't give you is, is that breadth of understanding, right? And so, you know, if you're an engineer, it means, that, you know, yes, you're using, you know, stack ABC during your workday, but, you know, you should be looking at what other cool things are, are being developed and playing with them in your spare time. Um, you know, if you're working for a company that has a lot of mobility inside of it, like, like New Relic does, you know, there's no reason you shouldn't work on an agent team for a while and then go work in our services team for a bit and check out site engineering. This is actually how you're going to become a distinguished engineer at New Relic. It's because you have built such a repository of knowledge and skills by having so much exposure to you know, broad problems, lots of different types of people, lots of different types of systems. That's what makes you an awesome engineer, is, is that exposure and that knowledge that you build. So I'm the director of data services. I run the engineering groups that uh, receive, process, store, and query the tsunami of data from our customers. So do you see yourself more as a data scientist, or an engineer, or a software developer? What, where, where do you fit on that continuum? Well, I think that I'm, I was a software engineer for many, many years, and there's a piece of me that always will be passionate about that. At this point, I really see myself as somebody who helps build organizations and create um, culture where people can do their best work. Oh, excellent. So culture is being the heart of what you want to do in an engineering team. That's, that's the important piece. That's the most important piece. And there are a lot of things that support culture. Um, you know, some of it is process. Some of it is mentorship of individuals. Some of it is how you set vision for the company as a whole. But that, that agglomeration of culture is what lets people come in and just excel every day and not just be you know, somebody checking items off a list, but drive an organization to the next level. So good culture will build good products, do you think? Is, is a sour and bad culture destined to produce crappy software? I, I, think, it, I think it will. I think it will. Um, I think you might get some short-term gains, um, and you might get some, uh, some unusual outliers where your crappy culture did produce something good once in a while. Um, but we're in it for the long term, and we're in it to have a team that works together for, for many years. And we want to have consistent success. Um, so if you want to do that, if you want to be doing good stuff all the time and have lots of people along with you doing that too, you have to focus on, on your culture.